Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 6, 2015. This is the week in charts. I prematurely popped my cork on this one, but um, I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew so we can get everything in. I don't have a tremendous amount to cover, but if you've been to these shows before, you know I go off on a tangent or two or three or four. But I think we should have plenty of time to get to any questions you may have and all your stock picks. Uh, anyway, before we do that, there's a disclaimer screen. It's easier to sum it up like this. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what do we talk about? Well, actually, I got the wrong date in here. This should be the 6th. So we'll fix that real quick. I got criticized recently for showing a winner. It's like, um, I guess you can't win <laughs> in this game. 08, 06. Anyway, um... And the thing about it is, as I wrote in the column yesterday, or day before, is that uh, yesterday, is that winners are a little bit more work than losers. So for the most part, and most be the keyword in that sentence, with a losing trade, you just need to let it be a passive decision versus an active one. In fact, we'll jump right into that in just a few minutes. Um, if you don't mind, just um, in fact, we have. Um, I, I think we have. We could probably uh, manage this today. Uh, so if you have any questions in general, feel free to start asking them now. Hold off on your stock picks until we get to the charts so I can make sure I get to the, all the questions that are on the slides. And then once we get to the stocks, just ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many stocks as you want, but just if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time. It'll make me easier to make sure. Uh, uh, this will help to ensure, I should say, that it cover all your questions. Okay. As I just alluded to, we're going to talk about taking managing winners versus losers with losers as i just said you pretty much need to take your lumps and we'll look at that in one second but if you get stopped out you get stopped out it is what it is move on dust yourself off pick yourself up start all over again okay um trying to hang on to losers is is a is a bad situation i was talking with someone a few days ago and they had a bunch of stocks that they just let uh, deteriorate for a long long time in their portfolio and that becomes more and more stressful with time and, and here comes a tangent i wasn't even expecting but you know me wind me up and I, I can't shut up but uh once you have that loser and you let it grow and grow and grow then it begins to consume you and not only is it detrimental to your portfolio but psychologically, it will begin to consume you. And what's pretty amazing is every now and then, and I did it just yesterday, it kind of reminded me of this. It's like every now and then I'll fat finger a, um, a stock when I'm putting it in the spreadsheet, and I'll be off by one digit. And that one digit can make a huge impact on the overall portfolio as much as maybe 30% or more of the portfolio if you if so by not honoring your stop you could really do a lot of damage not just monetarily but also the psychology that comes with that and like i said earlier the gentleman that was holding on these positions it i don't know about him personally but i've seen it ha quite often in the past happen to where it begins to consume them and they're so busy focusing on those positions that they don't see the new positions when they come along. And as I think I wrote in the first book, my first book, Dave Lanier on Swing Trading, I was talking with a broker, and um, he was a broker friend of mine. I wasn't actually using him for trades, but we became friendly. I mean, he did a lot of trading on his own. And conditions were fantastic. And I'm like, well, hey, you doing? how you doing? Uh, uh, what do you got? What's going on? And he's like, well, I'm not taking on any new positions. This was like in 99 or early 2000 when everything was blowing and going, because I'm nursing a lot of losing trades. Well, I'm not sure what that means, nursing a lot of new losing trades, but obviously it was consuming him. And just the other story that I put in the book, just to kind of uh, point out that I'm not infallible, but uh, I remember once I walked into the gym, and I know you people are laughing that, that I would actually go to a gym, but it has happened on more than one occasion, or, or maybe one occasion, I should say, at least once a year. and Anyway, the receptionist was like, oh, what's wrong with you? She could see it plainly on my face. I kind of carry, I guess I carry my emotions on my sleeves. You know, I don't know. 
And I say, like, ah, I'm in a bunch of bad stocks. And she's like, well, sell them and buy a bunch of good ones. And it's like, you know, what she said made a lot of sense. That's not saying not follow your plan. I'm, Ed, um, stick with the positions if you're not stopped out. But if you are stopped out, then you don't want to stay with them. And again, make it more of a passive decision than an active one. Now, occasionally there's a little discretion involved. We'll talk about that in just one second. But keep in mind that this is not every day or all day. It's usually just a few minutes every three months or so. And you can maybe even set an alarm to let you know when a little discretion may be necessary. Maybe put an alarm where uh, the position is getting close to the stop so you'll get an alert on your smartphone or however you want to get that alarm. So you know that you might have to take a little action and apply a little discretion. Also, if the stop is getting close uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the day after, after the close and the stop is getting kind of close, you know that you might have to take action the next day. Okay, but keep in mind, this isn't every day. It's only every few months or so. We've only had uh, two or three discretionary calls so far this year. And every time there's a discretionary call, I always point it out, and, or almost always, I should say, point it out in the weekend charts and we discuss it. So it does take a little discipline to do these things and a little experience. But once you get it, it makes a lot of sense. But anyway, the point is that losers, for the most part, are a passive decision whereas winners it's a little bit more involved and i'm going to break this all down in just one second but you have to trail your protective stop higher fairly aggressively before the initial profit target is hit so um i used to preach one for one and sometimes i do it a little one for one depending on the market conditions uh lately i've been slightly more liberal in that and i'll explain that in a little bit more detail in one uh second or one minute but for the most part, it, it's close to one for one. So you are bumping that stop and moving that stop. And there is a little active management involved as, a, as the position moves more and more in your favor. And that's a good thing. And then you have to take partial profits when that profit target is hit. And then you have to spend some time sitting patiently. And then after that, you have to slowly loosen your stops. And this often by not doing anything as the position moves more and more in your favor. Now let's break these things down. It'll make a lot more sense with these figures. So let's say you've got some a trade looks pretty good. You got a nice trend, got a nice little pullback. You might even have a little TKO or some sort of little pattern that looks just fantastic. And you decide that's worth a shot. Well it triggers an entry and you put your stop in and it stops you out. Okay. So that's what a losing trade is going to look like. So, yeah, I'd much rather show a winner than a loser, but that's not the reason that I show more winners than losers. The reason is because it takes a lot of active management to stay with that winning trade. And it also takes – there's a little psychology involved too, whereas a stop, provided you're not applying – any discretion or if you made sure there's no discretion to be applied and you just put your stop in there's nothing to do that that will take care of itself if the market decides to take you out of position then so be it let the market take you out of the position and then move on and find something else so as a general statement that's what you do with a stop every now and then though it will require a little bit of discretion okay so let's say you come into the market and the next day it begins to sell off or whatever. It sells off over a few days and you're getting pretty close to your protective stop. Say your protective stop is right here. Well, you know, there's a good chance in early trading it might come down and tag that stop. And then it could just return, go straight back up. And obviously it might tag it and keep on going. So if you are disciplined and that stop is getting close, you can allow that market to open and see if it gets hit like on a fast move on the open and immediately returns and goes back higher. So what you have to have in mind, though, is you have to have an uncle point. I don't know where uncle point comes from. I'll have to do a little research on that. Uh, but an uncle point is a point where you give up. You say uncle. You say, oh, that's it. Okay. No more. And you get out, no questions asked. Knowing that two minutes later it might reverse. Okay. But the problem is you can't be the proverbial 
deer at the headlights and have it go through your stop. It's like, okay, I got an uncle point, and then goes through your uncle point, and then it just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. At the end of the day, let me try to make that a little cleaner. At the end of the day, you're way down here, okay, and then you're a hurting pup. Okay, so they don't always come back, obviously, and I don't want to make it look like every losing trade could come right back. What I am saying is you have a brain sloshing around in your head, so you want to you want to use it and apply a little bit of discretion, and that's going to really help you out because if you could stick with one big winner, the ultimate goal, remember, is, is, is this, okay? And one or two big winners is all you need. Now, I'll make it sound a little bit more elusive. I should say it's more elusive than it really is because because sometimes you wonder when that big winner is going to come along. But if you position yourself right with the tread and you're using proper position and money management, eventually all that will take care of itself. Now, eventually can be a while. That's why I've always tell people if you're just looking at one or two months of the trading service, you're really not getting the whole picture because if that – during that time, if I'm printing money, markets don't always cooperate, as anyone who's traded for more than a few days knows. If during that time things are choppy and I'm not making anything, then you might think, well, guy never makes anything, okay? Well, that's because you didn't stick around long enough for that big trend to come along. Like I preach over and over, you need to go through a few of these cycles, a few iterations, uptrend, downtrend, and just play sideways trend, okay? Now... So, again, the real money is out here. And if you can just stay with one or two trades, and I'm, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind. Let's say you've got a five-point stop. Things are getting a little iffy. You give her an extra 50 cents when it looks like it wants to come down and nick that stop. And you get stopped out, you get stopped out. Now, if you make uh, 50 points on a trade, okay, not that that's going to happen every day. It's going to make up for a lot of these little incremental possible losses. Now, the worst case scenario is if you have a possible opening gap reversal. I'm sorry, an opening gap. So your stop is here, and the market opens well below the stop. Now, if you're not disciplined, just get out, okay? and or if you don't have any experience with these things. But get educated and get some discipline. What happens overnight, and we're going to look at a live example here in just one second, but sometimes some bad news or even good news that's perceived as bad, as we'll look at again in a few minutes, comes out overnight. Now, if you are a market maker and you're required to buy stock, and everybody and their brother wants to sell a stock. And you are going to be left holding the bag, so to speak. You have to buy that from them. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to lower that price to a point where you can turn around and sell it and make money. Okay. The market maker is in the business of making money like you. He's trying to make money, too. He's got mouths to feed, okay? So he's going to drop the price of the stock as low as he can. I don't know if there's any legalities to all this. But he's going to lower that price until it's to a point where it's so low that he perceives it as a bargain. Now, every night he gets screwed. So you can't, you can't get mad at him. He's just doing his job, okay? Just like he can't get mad at you for you doing your job. But he might drop that price really, really low, knowing that it's so low, it's a bargain. And once that initial selling gets in there, he could flip it out later in the day and make a lot of money. Okay. Now, I'm not a big, huge fan of day trading, but sometimes these opening gap reversals can be used, or as I call them, ogres can be a wonderful time to get into trades, can be – sometimes it's kind of the money line in the corner trade. You can just go in, play that opening gap reversal, pick up a few bucks, and then move on. Again, I don't want to 
I don't want to suck you into day trading, but sometimes, again, they can be some wonderful opportunities. And there's a whole – people spend their whole lives just trading gaps, okay? But let's say he does open that stock really, really low. Well, again, you need to have an uncle point, but let's assume that it's already below your stop where it opens it. You have to have a point where you're going to get out at no questions asked, okay? And, again, that would be the proverbial – deer in the headlights and if this stock begins to turn back up then you might actually end up st sticking with the positions now if it's a disaster or disaster as they say in italian no and it opens like way down here and then begins to reverse and come comes back up you might just look to get out at some point to mitigate your losses let's say you got a 10 point whack overnight and it comes back about five or six points intraday uh, you might say, okay, you know what? Well, I'm just down four points now. I'm going to go ahead, lick my wounds, and take that loss. But if it comes back above your stop, then it's a no-brainer. You stick with the position, okay? So a little discretion can help. I wish you were following up on these positions in the service after officially removing them from the rest of the list. It would help in learning. Well, uh... There's nothing to do a lot of times. The reason there's no need to follow up, let's go back to the prior one. There's no need to, okay, let's say this is X, Y, Z, whatever, okay? And we get a trigger on X, Y, Z, and it stops out, and it keeps dropping. There's nothing to do, okay? Because you should have honored your stop. Every now and then, Shay, if you go back and look at the, I don't know how many of, uh, it's kind of tricky for me to get the old uh, weekend charts up, but um I've been putting on YouTube, putting them on YouTube for quite a while. And every now and then I will show a stock like this one here where it stopped out. And let's say we lost a full loss. We lost 2% on the whole position. Okay. Every now and then I'll show one a month later or two months later where it's way down here. And say, well, you know, we would have lost 40% of the portfolio or whatever. That's a little extreme. But let's just say 20% of the portfolio. Had we not gotten out here as opposed to 2%, I mean, had we rolled it out. So I'm not sure exactly what you're saying about continuing to follow up uh, with them once they get stopped out. There's nothing to do. That's when we need to go on and, and try to find some new opportunities and focus our energy on, on finding new opportunities. So I'm not sure why you're asking um, about following up after you're stopped out. Now, every now and then, let's say we're trailing the stop. Let's say something does work out. Forget about this right here. Let's say something works out. And every now and then, we'll get stopped out, and then it'll turn around and go right back up. I mean, that's life. And I'm not going to follow up with that <laughs> because that's just going to uh, piss everybody off. You know, It's kind of like a, um, it's the fish that got away. But it happens. Trust me, it happens. And, and sometimes I've looked back at things that had some uh, deep corrections along the way that we were actually in and got knocked out and they still eventually turn into good longer term trades. Uh, the good thing is not always, but sometimes those that stop out like that will set up again and allow us another chance to get back on uh, the trade. And, and psychologically that can be a little tough because you're like, well, you know, we were in this from way back here and now it's uh, it's already doubled from that level. It's kind of hard to buy at a higher level, but sometimes not all the time, sometimes, that's the thing to do. So uh, if you could kind of elaborate on your question, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Now, in my column, I showed this as, a, as two things. One, a losing trade. And two, maybe this is what you're asking, a discretionary call. To keep things simple in the trading service, if something stops out mechanically, then I take it out of the portfolio, okay? But in reality, if you have a situation like this where the stop is just a Nats eyelash above, or I should say, uh, or, or just trades, I should say. Let me rephrase that. It just trades a Nats eyelash below the stop. Gaps lower on the open or has a fast move on the open, just barely gets below the stop and then reverses nicely, then obviously you want to stay with that position. 
Now, mechanically, I will take this out of the portfolio. But, yes, I hear what you're saying. Um, keep it in the portfolio. I've done this once or twice before where I've kind of show it up here. Portfolio's down here, mechanical portfolio. And then up here, it's like, okay, here's your discretionary call. And here's some ideas on how to stick with that position. Like, if, especially if you just stops out by a penny or so. But in a case like this, here's a discretionary call on a stop. And you need to decide whether or not you're going to stick with that position or not via an uncle point. Now, uh, Fitbit went against this overnight. And we have a stop at 44. We initially uh, trailed that stop up like this. Now it went 44. It gapped op overnight. And now it's kind of trading lower. Well, when they open well above your stop, I mean, unless it comes out here, just just barely touches it to a T. But once you get through that open, for the most part, most of the discretion is going to happen right around the open. Okay. All right, Shay, I got you. You stayed with some? Cool. All right. Well, I'll keep that in mind. I'll put, I'll keep that in the, um, I'll keep that in mind. So that, good point. I like, I like the way you think. Okay. So it gap lower and it didn't hit the stop around the open. Usually that's where most of your discretion is going to be. But if this reverses by the end of the day, obviously, well, because you did get stopped out, you stay with it. But let's say that your stop was like right here. Well, you give it a little room after the gap to see if it comes down and hits your stop. And if it comes back up above your stop, then you stick with the position. Okay, any questions on uh, applying a little discretion to a losing trade? I'm not saying throw caution to the wind and stay with the loser because I often preach you know, if your stop is hit, you must quit, okay? What I'm saying is you can occasionally use your brain because the market doesn't move on exact. It's like we had one got stopped out at nine. And someone asked me, well, Dave, why didn't you set your original stop at 8.99, one penny below? I'm like, man, I'm not that good. I mean, if I was that good, I'd own the world. And, and you know what? Nobody is that good. By the way, that's one thing that's really been uh, a godsend for me over the years is to be around all these professional traders and money managers and some of these guys are running billions. And uh, I'm not name dropping or doing this to brag. It's just that I've I've been able to move in these circles and I got really lucky early on and, and hooked up with some old school guys and all. And I've been blessed with the whole process. And the, where I'm going with this is what's amazing is they have their ups and downs too. And they're human and they have their emotions and they're not perfect. And then you could, uh, on any one of these individuals, you can pick out points in time where they had some really bad times from a performance standpoint. And then they know that they don't know. And from a novice standpoint, you think, well, these guys – if I do what they do, then I really would, I really would have this down pat. Now, obviously, they have some experience that you do need, but keep in mind that the expert doesn't have all the examples. I think that's where I'm going with that. Is that the novice tends to think that the, that the expert knows everything? Okay, trust me, stuff happens. I probably talk about that a little too much. Okay. All right, now. Let's take a look at how winners are more work. Okay, first of all, if you do trigger red and the stock begins moving in your favor, then you're going to trail that stop a little bit more aggressively. So you're going to be adjusting that stop every day, or at least every day it's moving in your favor. And again, as a general statement, it's one for one, but you can give it a little bit of room even on the first loaf. But you do want to be quite aggressive because we're going into a trade as a swig trader, okay? And we're trying to keep that risk down as much as possible. And then we are going to slowly allow that stop to widen out. But we're trying to keep the short-term risk in line. We're trying to trade like a, a short-term trader until we can change hats and go to a longer-term trend follower. 
And remember, longer term trend follower is going to require much wider stops and you're not going to be as right as often. Whereas shorter term trader trading is tighter stops and you're going to be right a little bit more often. OK, but we want to transfer to the longer term trader because that's where the money is. So you look to take partial profits when you're you hit your initial profit target okay and then obviously you're bumping that stop up now when you hit that initial profit target another thing you have to do is you have to you have to immediately bring that stop up to break even because that's how the methodology plays out with the money and position management now once you get to break even barring overnight gaps the worst you could do is scratch out of the second loaf of the trade now one thing that has to happen which is hard for many is to wait you have to wait and let the trend unfold okay if there is to be a trend and then as the trend begins to unfold you need to slowly widen that stop out now sometimes you don't do anything let's say you leave the stop here and then it moves up a little bit here then that stop let's say it moved from um went from here to here and you didn't do anything with your stop. Well, you just let that stop widen out by that amount, by not doing anything, okay? But then again, you have to slowly let it widen out as the trend moves more and more in your favor. So you're trailing aggressively at first, then you're moving it to break even, then you're taking, as you're taking partial profits, and then you're slowly letting it widen out longer term. So there's a lot more to do with the winner, and that's why I spent a lot more time talking about managing winners now uh you know truth be told I'm, I'm much more excited to talk about a winner and it sure does make me look better but a lot of times that gets misconstrued as a fact that i'm oh look at my winners and if anything as i often preach i probably preach a little too much about the money management at all but i'm going to keep doing that because that's vitally important and if i can keep you in the game i could feel good from an altruistic standpoint that hey you're, you stayed the game and you're off being successful. And from a more of a capitalist standpoint, maybe you will hire me to help you, okay, in the educational side. Or maybe you'll go off and run a fund and give me a call. Now, here's the live example of sticking with the position. This was a dead buddy report from a week or two ago. And this was the one I got criticized on for showing a winner. It's like, well, you know, I... I in your face i want to show a winner every day i want to show 10 winners every day but again back here we entered we had a stop not a whole lot happened right away you had the trail that stop higher take the partial profits notice that we jumped that up to break even as the um and this has got a little bit of lag in it but as the position hit the initial profit target didn't do a whole lot here other than wait okay and then trail a stop a little bit wait and then wait, and then wait, and wait, and wait, and wait, and wait. And then finally, oh, look, we're going to take off again. We're going to trail in that stop again, okay? And then hopefully, and there's that word hope again, but hopefully ride out the winter for a long, long time. Any questions or any thoughts, any uh, complaints uh, <laughs> so far before we hop into the um, charts? Looks like we're getting there pretty quick today, so we have plenty enough time. Uh, $47 trial is back in my service. And if you're interested in that, either go to the store and click on the core trading service or go to DaveLander.com trading service. Uh, once you just put this, uh, it, I don't have a cart system, but but click on this order form. And then this is your promo code here, 47 trial. And your first month's $47. And then all the terms and such are here and on the page. So check those out. But uh, most, I would say 99% of everything I show unless it's just a wonderful learning example outside of it. But 99% of everything I show in this week of charts comes directly from the service, good, bad, and indifferent. Uh, sometimes I'll throw the portfolio up, warts and all, um, so you can see what's going on. And you can also download 10 uh, years of archives on that. So email me for information on that. They're kind of scattered around with different uh, hosting services, but they're all out there if you're willing to um, to download them. Uh 
I have a store, obviously, DayLearner.com store. Go to my website, click on products. There's also free reports on there, so you don't have to spend any money to get started. Uh, download the free reports, get a newsletter, which I put out uh, several times a week, and then subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've got 1,300 videos, 1,360 videos, I think, 60-something, and check them out, okay? What do you take at the first profit target, Joe? Uh, Joe, we take uh, 50%, okay? So in every trade... We're taking two percent, and let's just use 100k because that makes the math easy. Two percent of 100k. So every trade we're going to risk two thousand dollars, and we want to make one percent or a thousand dollars, obviously on that account, on the first loaf, and we want to make some multiple thereof, hopefully infinity, on the second. And I've got a lot of. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we've got a lot of videos out there. But let's say the stop is five points. You're taking profits at five points. And some people might immediately scream negative expectancy. And feel free to do that if you want to. But it does not have a negative expectancy because we're going to leave this open-ended. Ideally, an ideal trading system, you want to have limited losses and the potential for unlimited gains. And many times I see systems that have just the opposite. And just the opposite systems, okay, Let's say you're taking one point, risking five. Guess what? You're going to be right a lot more than you're wrong, okay? Because that market's more likely to move one point than it is to move five, okay? So you're going to chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away. Bam! You're going to get whacked. And now you're going to make five winning trades in a row. And chances of that happening, eh, it could happen. I mean, with a highly accurate system, but you're bound to have a few winners in between and here's the big problem when you end up with a few losers in there now let's say you get three losers in a row now you have to make back you have to make, make back you have to make back 15 points and you need 15 winning trades so a highly accurate system could could work its way into the ground really quick uh, I've doodled with a little bit of everything in my career it's not by way a highway but um, this is the way I do it. Shay, hold off on that. We'll get to the uh, we'll get to the charts. Okay. So you take off half, okay? All right, let's um let's hop out into the charts. Yeah. Yeah, uh FID has officially hit the stop. That's what Shay's asking here. Okay. And if it just you have to have an uncle point in mind, okay? Maybe you can give it one more point, okay? Let's say 43. Now, that's not saying throw caution to the wind, but if it starts to bottom out in here, but yeah, so now it's it, the stop was at 44, drop below it, so now you have a stop in place, all right? So you get stopped out, you get stopped out, okay? We'll go off and we'll find some more stocks to trade when the opportunities present themselves. You can't rush out and say, oh, well, I bet I replace that money as quick as I can because the market doesn't care that you just lost on that trade. Okay. Now let's take a look at the let's start looking at the market. Let's look at the micro and then work our way out. Okay. Now today obviously peas are not doing too well. Yesterday they rallied up, came back in. That scores is a bummer. Today they're getting whacked a little bit in here. If you back the chart out, you can see that we haven't made a lot of progress, or any progress, I should say, in a long, long time. Let's go all the way back to, well, there's December right there. And we could probably go into November. Yeah, it depends on which date you pick in November, but you can certainly see that pretty much since last Thanksgiving, we haven't made a whole lot of progress in the piece, okay? And now they're getting whacked today. Um, don't get too caught up or too concerned in a day-to-day -day action when the market is stuck in a range like this. Now, when a market first starts to chop sideways, you don't know if it's going to keep chopping sideways or if it's just consolidating and what's going on. But if a market's been chopping sideways for a long, long time, then it's pretty obvious that the trend has become sideways. And as I wrote, I think in the last column, if you ever get confused, just take today's close. We'll use yesterday's close and draw a line back in time. And as you can see, the close was right about that point way back in December and, again, November 
depending on how you look. Now it's November based on today's action. And so you got a horizontal line, and like I said in the column, make that into an arrow as I've done here. If we put the 200-day moving average on the chart, you'll see that so far it has held, and based on today's action, it looks like it wants to come down here and challenge that 200-day moving average, okay? Uh, longer term, you want to err on the side of the trend. We did have a sell signal, I think, back here, and it didn't pan out, but sometimes you have to get out the way. But as a general statement, you want to err on the side of the trend. Also, you can't exit all your positions every time something gets a little iffy because if you do, you're never going to catch a trend. So the market's been a little iffy in here on and off. It's iffy today. It's iffy this morning, okay? But you want to stick with your positions until you're stopped out, good, bad, or indifferent. So that's a little concerning in the S&P 500. By the way, I don't want to digress too far, but the other thing I wrote about is like the market's going perfectly sideways, and there's a lot of people out there. They read into everything so much, or they have such complex methodologies that somehow, even though the market is just going sideways, they make these big picture predictions like it's the end of the world, like it's the top. Well, predict early and often is what I say, and eventually you'll get it right. And that makes for wonderful newsletter writing, okay? But the reality is a lot tougher, just like it's a lot tougher in my trading service than it is for me to write about the markets on my website and in my newsletter, right? Because in the trading service, I'm actually picking stocks and managing stocks and showing things in real time, okay? And then we have to see how they unfold, good, bad, or indifferent. Whereas if you're just out there making calls and writing newsletters, then your life is going to be a lot easier. And there's going to be a lot of hindsight and cherry picking and things like that that happens. Whereas if you're making calls on every day, everything every day, it becomes a lot harder. The point I'm trying to make, I, I know I'm digressing a little bit in here, is like you can't, at least from my experience, you can't look at this and say, oh, it's the mother of all tops until you have some sort of signal. And for me, that has to be a momentum-based signal until the moving averages begin to roll over, cross over, or until it breaks down and or until it breaks down below this range in here. I'm not going to get too excited. Yes, today sucks, okay, especially if you're long. Uh, NASDAQ getting whacked a little bit in here, down a percent and almost three quarters. So it's pretty serious uh, spanking yet here. You got to be careful, though. You can't just say, well, it's the end of the world. Uh, we're going to go to hell in a handbasket or whatever the saying is. Uh, you just got to gotta hang in there. If you get stopped out, you get stopped out. But again, with this market going as sideways as it has been for a long, long time, you don't want to rush out and get aggressive on one side of the market or the other. The good thing is we haven't seen a whole lot of setups. Now, we did see a few setups over the last several months that looked pretty good, that looked viable in spite of the sideways market. But now that we've been chopping and chopping and chopping and chopping, it's kind of like the market caught up to us. We're no longer seeing setups. And that's okay. And one of the things I was kind of noodling with a little bit before the show was that if you take a look at the S&P 500, your volatility has dropped off considerably. Well, it's not rocket science on a net, net basis. And, and by the way, the least historical volatility is measured on a closing basis. So if those closes are pretty much the same as where they were for whatever your time period that you're measuring is, okay, then the volatility is going to get lower and lower and lower, okay? So the market becomes relatively unchanged. So you could just kind of eyeball that and say, well, this market's got like kind of a median line or, in fact, let's just do that. We've got time. Let's do like a linear regression line, which is going to be equivalent to my horizontal line. But if you want to make things a little bit more uh, interesting, put a median, you know, linear regression line in here or something, you could see that, well, it's a little higher here. But you could see that if you go back all the way to, let's say, February or so, and that's a mathematical line in here. But for me, I just rather draw a trend line. But you can see that the fact that the market is relatively unchanged over months and months, it means the volatility has dropped off. Now, we've had a little volatility within the range, but you're still in a range nonetheless. Now, the good thing is 
volatility usually comes back in the fall. So we could see some nice moves this fall. Will they be up or down? Well, let's just take these one day at a time and see. NASDAQ obviously getting whacked here. Longer term so far, this 200-day uh, moving average has held. But the 200-day moving average obviously is going to catch up with the market as the older periods are dropped off. And the higher periods here, the lower periods, I should say, are dropped off. And the higher periods are added in. It's called a drop-off effect. So this will be, begin to accelerate slightly towards the prices. Now, let's take a look at the Russell 2000. The Russell 2000 has been bumming me out for quite a while. And it's a little bit uglier than the other indices. You can see today, once again, we're back below the 200-day moving average. The only thing good about the Russell is the fact that there is some support just below the market. Okay, so you do have some support down here if the market begins to sell off. But I wouldn't buy a market just because it has some support under it. Okay, now it is good to short a market if there's no support under it. Okay, but that's why I'm not rushing out and wanting to short the Russell, even though it's looked a little ominous in here. You had a bow tie in here, kind of a sharp retrace that looked like it was going to negate that bow tie, but then it rolled right back over. And now you've got another pullback. And if you're just looking at thrusts and then you kind of deep retrace and then thrust and then pullback, it looks like we're triggering another pullback lower. Okay. But again, you got a lot of support below the market. So I'm not going to get too excited about the Russell just yet, but it certainly is on my radar or something to pay attention to. A couple of things before we hop into the sectors. Let's, well, by the way, before I forget, let's take a look at Apple. I mean, everybody wants to look at Apple. I think Apple is done. Stick a fork in it. Um, Apple's a cold stock. Every time it sells off, it comes back. But one time that's not going to work. And I think that it's kind of, I think it's sucked everybody into thinking that it will. Uh, not the end of the world if Apple sells off. It doesn't mean that we're entering a bear market. But it certainly doesn't help that it is selling off. And it does look like a top is in place. Uh, you had your gap down. And reversal gap strategy would say, okay, you got a gap down from uh, close to all-time highs in this particular case. And then you look to trade the first pullback. Now, I wouldn't have taken this trade, nor did I take this trade, because I don't like Apple because it's a big fixed stock as a general statement. But technically, it was set up here, and now you have a mountain of overhead supply to overcome. So if this stock begins to rally back up, it's going to have a hard time getting through this overhead supply. Nothing magical about the way I do technical analysis. All I'm saying is anybody who bought the stock during that range is going to look to get out of break even. It's human nature, okay? So remember, like Tom McClellan said, when you buy a stock, you're not only forming a relationship with the company and expecting the company to do right things, but you're also – or good things. You're also forming a relationship with anyone else who owned the stock prior to you, anybody who's bought the stock prior to you. And as he goes on to say, those people screw you, okay? So these people decide to dump. Let's say you're long Apple or you're trying to pick a bottom in Apple, and these people decide to dump their stock. It's going to push it down, and you'll be a herding pup. Let's take a look at the interest rates. Uh, here's the bonds. We do have a bow tie up in bonds on a nice inflection point or a nice angle against the 50-day moving average. If you back the stock or the whatever, the ETF way out, you can see we're coming off of uh, like one year plus lows, but it's not like multi multi year lows like the bow tie back here or some of those way back in time. So that's a minor signal, okay? And it's still a buy signal nonetheless, but it's a minor buy signal. I wouldn't rush out and buy bonds just because of that. But the good thing is, so far, it's headed higher. Now that means. Rates are dropping once again. Uh, I still think the major signal is in place. Here's your major, major signal here because it's coming off of all-time highs or certainly multi-year highs. Let's double-check that. Is it all-time highs? Yeah, it's all-time highs. Okay. So you've got a major sell signal here, and you got a minor buy signal here because of the bow tie has come back up. So at least for now, interest rates have stabilized. Okay. Now, let's take a look at some of the sectors in here. Now, like I've been saying recently, it all depends on where you look and what you see. Health services just broke out in here. Okay. They're not doing so well today. 
but uh, so great today, I should say. But they just broke out it here, so that looks that looks okay. Okay, not set the world on fire, but a breakout nonetheless. Retail recently broke out in here, coming back in a little today, but at least it broke out. At least it's hanging around its old highs. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, drugs is a general statement, not too far from the old highs, stalling a little bit out of the old highs. Okay, but so far so good there. Did it for biotech, selling off a little bit today. But so far, longer-term uptrend, as you can see, is still in place, not too far from its old highs. Foods and a lot of these brick-and-mortar type of areas have been doing pretty good in here, doing pretty well, I should say, in here, today notwithstanding, okay? So that's kind of the good. And the bad is a lot of areas have been trading mostly sideways, like the overall market itself. And the ugly is you got some areas like the semis, which are breaking down from high levels and look like they're in a lot of trouble. And now they're almost in a, you call that a bona fide downtrend. Obviously, metals of mining have been heading lower as of late for quite a while, though they do look like they're scraping bottom in here. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just because of that. And ditto for gold and silver. They look a little sold out, but obviously they're dropping Nonetheless, other commodity-related areas like the energies, there they are, are looking pretty ugly in here. Now, one thing that I often joke about is, you know, the old saying, oh, it's always darkest before it, it gets light. But it's always darkest before it gets more dark. So if you're trying to catch a bottom in something, it's such a bad idea because many times it could go much, much further, okay? These uh, energies, and you could go and say the same thing for metals and mining if you want. They look like they were kind of sold out, kind of bottoming out way back here. In fact, when they were back in July, it's like, hey, it looks like they're bottoming out or trying to start bottoming out. But we're not going to try to catch the falling knife just yet. We're going to wait for some sort of signal, a bow tie, a first thrust, or whatever the case may be. And that might take a while to unfold, and then the market continues to break down. So what do we do? Well, we sit on our hands and just get out of its way. Or stay out of its way, I should say. We don't try to catch that fallen knife until the trend begins to turn. You're never going to be completely right, okay? And you need to give up trying to catch those bottoms and catch those tops and just let things unfold, okay? Did we cover that? Yeah, we covered that, Shay. Um you just need to have an uncle point in mind, and then if it uh, takes it out, it takes it out, just like I just preached, okay? All right, let's let's um, let's start looking at um, – let's open it up for individual stocks. Any questions on uh, individual stocks you guys want me to cover? We'll start going through those. We already talked about Apple. Anything else? And let's open it up for any questions in general. L. Matt for Jerry. Hey, Jerry. Well, at first glance, it's kind of interesting. But one thing that the – it's okay. The the breakout – it's kind of like just these one, three big bars is your whole breakout. But I do like the way it's retraced back in. Uh, volume is a little low for an established stock, so it's a little dangerous to trade. But based on today's knockout move, it looks pretty good. It looks it looks okay. All right. If it if it pulls back much further, then you're back to the base. But I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an okay on that one. Uh, by all means, wait for an entry. And that's the beauty when you get these TKOs like these the trend knockouts where you get the big wide range bar down. Is that and it closed poorly? It's like we saw one yesterday that looked good because it was a nice TKO, but it closed up towards the top, and it's almost at new highs. And it just didn't think it was worth to go out, worthwhile to go out and buy it, especially because it was extended and in high levels like this stock is here. This stock looks a little extended. I mean, it's going up about 100% over a fairly short period of time. But with this knockout move in here, I'm not going to use the word safe, but it's a little safer to get in now that you've got a bit of a knockout type of move. So I think it looks okay, Jerry. Um, with those few caveats in there, it is kind of thin, okay? Okay, Dathan wants to know about Derm, and he says, oops, 
good questions coming in. Um, okay, I lost it. Uh, do you think uh, the f do you think do you trust the trigger of that new stock, Derm? Okay. Well, I think it looks okay. Uh, it's it's super thin. Okay, so you got to be super careful. As a private trader, you can still trade it, and with IPOs or relatively new issues, I do give them a little bit of a pass. Uh, you've had a pretty good run in here. The good news is it, is it did accelerate higher. You know, I never really trust the market. I'm always skeptical of all markets. But, yeah, I think that looks okay um, as a possible stock and a trigger. Uh, CSTE, first thrust down. CSTE. No. Okay, that's too much. That's too extreme. Okay, everything. It's kind of like... Everything, I don't I hate to say moderation, for la but for lack of a better word, everything within moderation. So this stock has just imploded, and I think it's too late to try to short it. It just happened to implode, okay? So if this was kind of a little bit more, if this was over a few days time period, or maybe not quite as, as sharp of a drop, Based on the volatility of the stock, you got to realize this thing went from 70-something down to 40-something. And the normal HV is only 22. By the way, this is a good example of why we trade more volatile stocks. Because if you were trading a stock with such a low HV, then you would have to trade a whole lot of shares. And guess what? This black swan event like this can still occur. And that's obviously a bad thing, okay? So, yeah, I would pass as a possible short based on the magnitude of the deal. Not under, not sure why you set the stop at 44 and fit. Well, because it actually, if we were trailing it, uh, let's take a look at that. What happened was we were trailing it higher, okay? So let me get, let me see if I can put it in the, uh, in the deal. We're just following the plan. Let's see if we may come up. Technically, it should have actually been a little higher. And then the other thing, too, is I know it's, it doesn't help, but tremendously. But you got to realize that that's not even a full loss, even though today was kind of ugly. It's not even a full loss in the position. So what happens was we, we trailed the stop. I'm not sure exactly where all the, the numbers pan out. But what happened was the market began to go up, so we began to trail a stop higher, and we got stopped out, okay? So that's what happened. That's why it was at 44. So as it moved higher, we moved the stop higher. Anytime you move your stop and you get stopped out at or around that stop and you move that stop higher, then you're losing less than, you know, if it gets stopped out way down here, when you first get in, you're going to lose 2% of the position, Okay. Obviously, if it makes it to the initial profit target up here and you make 1% on the position and you get stopped out of the scratch on the remainder, then you end up making 1% plus 1%. Okay, so you start off in the hole at a minus 2% loss if you get hit, and then this decreases until it becomes positive after you get your initial profit target and you break even on the rest. Okay, LMAT for film. And PGNX. Sorry about that. I, okay. LMAT. LMAT. Oops. Let's see if we get the thing back in here. LMAT. Yeah, that looks good. Um, thin. Yeah, we talked about this one, didn't we? Uh, it's thin. Yeah, we just talked about this one. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. What was the other one, Phil? I deleted the wrong one. Shoot, I'm sorry. In the meantime, Andre, what's to know about LPCN? Um, the magnitude of this run here, it went straight up, okay? And that's kind of hard to sustain. Not that I wouldn't trade a stock that goes straight up, but it needs a little bit more knockout when I see a move like this. I want to see a little bit more substantial knockout move. It, it, again, it comes back to the moderation thing. It's too much of a good thing, so you want to see a little bit more knockout on that ELNK. That's the old Earthlink. I guess it still is Earthlink. Well, 
if you're tracking a momentum list, then obviously that needs to go on your momentum list, okay? And I seem to remember putting it on my list at some point. But yeah, um, on a pullback, it might be worthwhile. You want to see you want to see it clear eight decisively. So if it gets up to nine or change or whatever, and again, I'll know it when I see it, um, as I usually say on these breakouts. Then yeah, on a pullback. But yeah, for now, put it on your momentum list. But it's not set up at the moment. I I N S Y. Boy, I'm fat fingering things today. Question is, is, there, is that a trend knockout? Uh, I'm going to say no, because you just barely got past this prior peak in here, and then now you got your knockout move, okay? So, no. Always remember to look at things on a net-net basis, okay? And that's something I actually was going to cover in this presentation, but I ran out of time when I was putting my slides together. But go in and look at what I – well, I actually kind of covered it in the P's, okay? But – Look at where the stock is now, and look at where the stock was back in June. It hasn't made any progress based on that on a net net basis. Okay, so this really isn't a knockout move. A knockout move again, or as I have to preach, not again, but you want to have you want to have a nice trend in place. And ideally, the trend should look like this and like that. Let me just see if I can draw it a little bit better. I need to add back a white screen here so I can draw. Ideally, the trend should look like this and like that, accelerating, okay? And then it should also be a persistent one. It should tend to go up day after day after day after day after day. And then also have those things I talk about, the bars are widening, widening out and different things like that. And then you want to have your knockout move, okay? So after your knockout move, your TKO, trend knockout, okay, if you look back in time and use like where it knocked out from, and if you draw an arrow like this and most of the trading is way out here, then obviously you can draw a big arrow like this, okay, then you know that you're in a pretty nice trend and you're knocking people out of the trend. Conversely, if you have a trend – Oops, we lost it. Let's see if we can get it back up. Conversely, if you have a trend, what was I saying in here? Um, I, I lost my um, train of thought. I think the... Um, the point is that once it goes sideways, what are you knocking out? I think I kind of beat that point home. I, I lost when the thing crashed on me. I forgot where I was. Sorry about that. All right, let's 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 see if we can get back to where we were. <laughs> okay. Um, a, B, C, D. That almost seems like a joke, huh? <laughs> let's take a look at A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D. Um. First thing jumps out at me, and again, net net problem, okay? Where is it now? Where was it back in July? And where was that in July? That was uh, the July 6th. Today is what? August 6th. So this stock has gone nowhere in a month. Now, you have to be careful. And this is why, if you look at the stock selection course, this is why I spent so much time in a stock selection course looking at. Uh, things like this and talking about net net change and talking about deceleration. So you can see that this market would here, but then it that now it's here. Okay. So it's like the trend, as you can see, is decelerating. And then just look at things on a net net basis. So you see it's lost some steam in here. So I would leave that alone. <laughs> Dathan, I got the point. Okay. Yeah. I lost my, lost my trade of thought, but uh, you get the point. All right. PGTI. PGTI, uh, no, because it, it's too extreme of a move, okay, to do anything with. And then you also have a gap, so you wouldn't want to buy it, okay? So, no, that's too extreme of a move to do anything. But, yeah, that's what's kind of interesting today is, is we may have backed into something here 
we're having a lot of debacle du jour. So when you're putting together your your game plan or, or you're trying to get a sense for what a market is doing, you need to ask yourself, okay, do we have debacle du jour? Are most stocks going up? Are most stocks going down? Are most sectors going up, down, or sideways? What's interest rates doing? You kind of have to factor it all in. But, yeah, it seems like today we have a lot of debacle de jures, okay? I understand you have the high, stop higher on FIT, but why specifically 44? Um, just give it, a, give it a little room to breathe. Like I said earlier, you, as a general statement, you move the stop higher on a one-for-one -one basis, okay, before the first profit target is hit. But what I did was... I decided to give it a little bit of rum just in case it had a correction like it did today so we could hopefully withstand that correction. There's no there's no exact specifics to it other than I felt that there was no need to to cinch it up too tight. I thought it would be a good idea to give it a little room to breathe even before the initial profit target was hit. And that has worked out very nicely for us for quite a while, and maybe I'm in the back of my mind, maybe I'm factored in the fact that the market isn't just going straight up as it has, a, as it has been going sideways for, for months and months and months. And if you go back and look at the archives, you'll see on a lot of the big winners, I was a little bit less, um, or I should say a little bit more lenient on bumping that stop on a, up on a one-for-one -one basis. I'm almost letting it widen out a little bit even before that additional profit target is hit. So that's how that that's how the 44 came in. It went up a couple of points, and I only bumped it up about one point on the stop. So it's not don't try to um, put everything under a microscope. Okay, realize there is a little discretion, there is a little feel to it, and the wider your stop, the better chances, the better your chances are of catching a trend. Unfortunately, the wider your stops, the better the chances are. Or I should say, when you do get stopped out, you're going to lose more, okay? But then you have to move on and go find something else. A-N-T-H? I have a feeling there will be more questions on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, you know, you're looking at a net, net problem here. You just kind of barely got above the little breakout here, and now you're coming back to sit on top of the range. I mean, it does, it does have that box stock look to it where it's making a box on top of another box. But for me, it just it needs a little bit more. Uh, although when you back it way out, it looks pretty good. But to me, it needs a little bit more breakout. And then again, let's get back to the net debt thing. Um, yeah, it's a little higher. It's like seven percent higher than it was. Uh, I don't know a month and a half ago. But look at the HV of this thing. The HV has got eighty. It's an HV of eighty-five. So seven and a half percent in a sleepy food company or a sleepy utility. That's a big deal over six to eight weeks, whatever the case may be. Two butts. OK, but in this particular stock, that's 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 almost considered a, um, a little bit of a loss of that longer term momentum. And then again, you know, net net basis, uh, one more big bad afternoon. And now we haven't gone anywhere in a while. So in a case like this, I would have liked to see it a little bit more impressive breakout, maybe a little bit more break, maybe to like 13 and change or so. And then have a little bit pullback, maybe uh, no, uh, no more than 11 or so. OK. Did I miss you cover HZNP? I don't remember it. HZNP. Okay, let's back the chart out a little bit, see what we got. Okay, again, uh, draw your line, okay? It, it's not rocket surgery sometimes. And you can see that in this particular case, you know, it's pulled back to a level where it was three, four months ago, okay? Yeah, longer term, it still looks okay. And it does kind of look like a big picture knockout type of move. But now you're back to where you were a long, long time ago, as opposed to something that looks a little bit more like this, and, and then have the uh, the knockout move. Now you've got something that's – it's all the way back to where it was a long time ago. So, But it's not horrible. S-T-R-Z-A. Yeah, you've got a gap down here. This is not something that you want to take. By the way, here's your learning example. Um, let's say you did trade this pullback, which I can kind of pick apart. But let's just say you were trading this pullback. This is why you want to use a liberal entry, okay? Instead of entering right around this high, 
using slightly lower entry. Now, I know this is perfect hindsight, but somebody else brought the stock up. I didn't bring it up as an example. Uh, this might have been on my Landry list at some point. But anyway, you could see it gap down and then again to implode. Usually surprises happen in the direction of the trend, but sometimes it happens. Spell with a silent SH, right? Okay. But by using a fairly liberal entry, just in case they push that market higher, trying to suck into pullback players, it would keep you out of a bad trade. So maybe on a pullback, maybe on a bounce, but it looks like the bomb's already blown up here. It might be a little too late to jump in as a short, okay? Oh, you had some background noise? Okay, gotcha. Did you did you need to end up after? Do you need an up after a TKO? Uh, you need a trigger after a TKO. You don't want to catch that falling knife. So you need the market to go back up, obviously, after TKO move. In fact, maybe we can draw that on here. Oops. Boy, I am fat fingers today. So if you do get that knockout move, and this is a, this is the beauty of it, and we had one recently, and I can't remember the stock. If somebody's on the service, if you can remember it, I, I don't. I tend to try to forget, um, especially losers, quickly. In this particular case, it wasn't a loser, but I forget setups after they they no longer uh, are viable. But we had a stock that looked like this, and it closed way down here recently. Okay, this is probably my favorite pattern at least trend resumption pattern on, on the trend emerging trend and trend transition patterns. I like the bow ties in the first thrust, especially when they're coming off a big base is up a long, long time lows. Reason I'm, I'm digressing to all that is because if you watch these shows, you probably think, well, everything is, everything is his favorite setup, but that's my, this is my favorite trend resumption, meaning that we have an established trend in place. We could draw a big blue arrow, those net net things we just talked about, or, um, we could look at that and say, okay, well, this, this stock has moved up nicely. So if it closes way down here, if you put an entry up here, as we did recently in one, and then next day it does this, this, and it keeps doing that and begins to implode, then no capital was put into harm's way. If this stock comes all the way back up and triggers you in, then there's a good chance that this reversal could be a major reversal back in the direction of the longer term trend. So to answer your question, yes, you need the market to come back up after you um, have a trend knockout. And, and as always, you need a trigger. No trigger, no trade. As a trend follower, we're fighting the trend. I don't know what you mean. Oh, you got to. OK, OK. Uh, Dave, what are your first eggs? Is don't fight the trend. Any method is based on. on being a trend follow or being a trend follow or are we fighting the trend? No, because we're not fighting the trend because like what what have I recommended how many stocks have I recommended lately in a trading service? None. Okay? For for a while. There really has it and I'm grinding it out every day and spending hours in front of the screens trying to find a setup. And then I'm just not seeing many that are worthwhile. And then if I do see something, then I'm thinking, well it's gotta be really great before I'm gonna take it. So, no, I'm not fighting the trend. I'm I'm waiting for this trend to develop, or I'm waiting for the mother of all setups that I think can trade contra to the sideways trend. So uh, you want to rephrase your question? I don't know if that's the question or not. Nat, where would you place an entry? Eh, I hate shipping stocks. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't enter it. Um you know, this thing's, if anything, it's beginning to break down because you had a tiny little base in here, you broke out, and now you've came all the way back in, have come all the way back in. Now, a couple of days ago or a week or two ago, you kind of had a knockout move here that, yeah, around 17 would have been a good entry. But at this particular point in time, I would leave it alone. And you're actually on the cusp of a bow tie down. And, yeah, it's multi-year high, so that might actually be worth a short. Ideally, I like to see a short come off of, like, all-time highs, okay? Brian says, B X L T a flash or or on fire, a relative on California drought glow this morning. Trans for biz cards, geez. I look forward to the quality people share with them. Good love you. Okay. Good love you and yours. Nice. I do too. All right, Brian. Let's take a look at that. Uh, B L X T B 
BXLT. Sounds like a BLT. <laughs> yeah, this is um. Now, this is a, a situation where if this stock was at lower levels as an IPO, uh, when it makes that new closing high, it actually could be a buy. But in this particular case, because it's at higher levels, uh, it's not necessarily a buy. But you've got a gap higher. So, yeah, if this thing pulls back a little bit, it might be worth a shot. Okay. So I'm glad. So you got the business cards. Yeah, sorry it took me so long. I just <laughs> – I don't check that box off. Then, then uh, my follow-up is uh, sometimes abysmal when I have to write a letter or something. Interesting market, as you say. The top sectors on the upside are oil, drillers, gold, silvers, copper. Yeah, okay. Uh, Phil's got an interesting point, and and this is kind of the perverse nature of uh, of trading. Okay, so you've got these areas that are just ugly. Okay, let's take a look at like. Uh, Energy, for instance, okay? So it looks, it's just absolutely ugly, and then the whole market begins to come unglued. Well, what happens? These areas are so sold out that they could actually begin to rally. It's it's not that it would ever do something like that, but you could probably take the most sold-out sector there is, or most sold-out sectors there are, I should say, and then wait for the market to begin to implode and buy the most sold-out sectors and then flip them out quickly. You could probably base the whole trading system just on that. Not that I would personally do it because you're, again, you're catching that falling knife. But, yeah, they, that's, a little, that's the thing that's a little bit perverse about markets is sometimes the, the sectors of the worst downtrends have the greatest rallies when the market finally does begin to implode or if the market finally does begin to implode. Okay. Let's take a look at GLD, see what's going on there since we've got an ETF. Well, it's not up much. It's up a half a percent, but I guess a half a percent today is a a pretty good deal. It looks a little sold out in here, but I wouldn't rush out and buy it just because of that. HF, HF. Uh, no, see, you, you broke out, but then you pull back below your breakout. Now, is it possible short? Yeah, maybe, but it's kind of thin to short. Um, one thing that will kind of test out. And again, you know, the great thing I, I tell people, don't study everything in the world, but I guess it's easy for, you know, just find something simple and stick with it. But I guess it's easy for me to say because I've studied everything in the world and then I realize that maybe I should just find something simple and stick with it. But what I'm seeing here is if you have a base breakout and then it takes out the other side of the base, that'll actually, I hate to say test out, but I think it will test out. I think it seems like I've tested it before. And what I'm saying is this. Let's say you got a stock that's um it can do whatever it wants, but let's just say it's uh let's just say it's traded higher for argument's sake. Let's say it's worked its way higher, and then it begins the base like this. If it breaks out of the base and you short it when it comes back through the base on the other side, that'll actually test out, okay? And I think the reason is is that you trap in a lot of people, okay? All the breakout players get sucked in, and then everybody that owns it throughout this range here is happy. Like, hey, it's going back to new highs. I'm happy again. Everything's good, right? And then when it takes out the bottom of the range, I think everybody is like, uh-oh. Oh, crap. We're in trouble now, okay? So that will actually test out. Now, I don't actually trade that, okay? But it might be worthwhile. Well, TC uh, TC groups on real time, uh, so we could do a, we could probably do an update and uh, it'd be a little uh, it look a little better than what we're seeing so far. Gold is up only 0.4 percent. Oh, I see what you're saying. You have it updated. Okay. HF. Yeah, we talked about that one. PGTI. PGTI. Yeah, I think we talked about that one too, didn't we? It's just a little too extreme. PGNX, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. It 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 got past this prior high and pulled back in. Looks like we talked about this one last week, based on the chart pattern. I think I would pass. In general, it's a little wide and loose. 
Uh, you know, here's the thing. There's this is a market where there's not a whole lot to look at, or a whole not a whole lot to be traded. Okay, Jerry wants to look at this. Now, this is not bad. Have we talked about this one yet? Uh, this actually looks okay. I, mean, I could pick it apart a little bit, but if we had to find one of the better looking stocks today, it's probably one of the better looking ones. Uh, it's worked its way higher. It's kind of accelerated higher a little bit. Okay. And then you had kind of an opening gap reversal. It's kind of back where it was a while. I mean, again, I can pick it apart. I don't think I'd rush out and buy it. I'd like to see more correction over maybe like a few day period just because of the way it made new highs here and came in. But it's okay. It's it's not a bad looking stock. I'd like to see a little bit. Here's the thing. This is where the pick it apart is going to come in. I'd like to see a little bit more deeper pullback. But then if that happens, then you're pulling back into this level here. So I wouldn't rush out and buy this one um, anytime soon. But it's certainly a stock that's trending. And I think I would pass. But let's see what if it pulls back a little further. And then let's judge that pullback against where it was uh, back in time. But the momentum... In this particular case, even though it's it's pulling back to where it was back in time, at least it's got some momentum to it. See how you can it's it's kind of tricky. And this was a this is not a cut and dry example, but it's got a little bit of momentum higher to it. So a little bit deeper pullback maybe might be worthwhile on that one. So yeah, it's okay, Jerry. It's not jumping out at me, but it's okay. It's certainly better than a lot of things we've seen uh in this market lately. AFSI for art. Yeah, that looks fantastic. Um it is a little thin, though. You can see that I'm mean, not, not thin. Uh, what am I saying here? It's a little bit low in volatility. It's an insurance company. Um, and you can see that it has accelerated higher. For me personally, the HV is a little too low for me, but it looks okay. Now, you can see it has lost a little bit of momentum in here, but as a general statement, I think it looks okay. I wouldn't rush out and trade it, though, because the volatility is a little low. Um, at 18. What's the what's the spiders right now? About 14. Oh, 11. Wow. Oh, like I said earlier, yeah, volatility's dropped off. Uh, so it's pretty low, especially relative to the overall market. It's not that much higher than the overall market anymore. Now's the time. It's like I feel like I'm picking apart everything, but. Now's the time when you sort of have to pick apart everything. And you're probably thinking like, oh, this guy's like Mikey. He eats everything. And that's not necessarily the case because when things are, when things are doing really well, we're going to see a lot of setups. And I'm going to be pretty excited about everything. But now is not one of those times. And then you have to, in the back of your mind, you have to keep asking yourself, where were the S&Ps months ago? Where are they now? Okay. And if... On a net net basis, you don't have much change, then there's nothing to do. Okay. Starbucks. I'm not a huge fan of Starbucks because it's um lower in volatility. You know my favorite thing to do is is walk into Starbucks and ask for a cup of coffee. I like a cup of coffee. And they will look at you like you just crapped your pants. <laughs> I used to bring my daughter or one of my daughters with me to uh, Starbucks so so they could help me order, you know. Dad, you want to brood up vente, <laughs> room for cream. Okay, okay. Wait, wait, can you say that again? Oh, wait, could you just order for me? <laughs> yeah, so like a cup of coffee? Uh, um, this could be in a momentum list for sure, but volatility is a little low again on this. Now, you do get a bit of an aberration when something's in a good trend. Uh, you cert I certainly can't argue with it because it's been a pretty good trend, but it's not really set up at the moment. Maybe on a pullback, we could uh, we could argue a case for uh, a case for coffee here, but I don't think it's um, – it's not something I would necessarily go after, but you certainly can't argue with the fact that it has worked its way higher for a long, long time, and it is a persistent stock. So, yeah, on a knockout type of move, a little bit more knockout – Maybe if it knocked out to 55 or so, it'd be worth a shot. The problem is, again, with the lower volatility, even though it's made a really nice move, it's taken months and months and months and months and months for that move to unfold, okay? Shaq for Andre. Uh, yeah, it's kind of that first deep retrace, but then it kind of stalled out. 
Uh, there's nothing here for me. I mean, it took off. It broke out. It came all the way back in. And see, this is where, you know, first breakouts at IPOs are not a bad pattern to trade, okay? Even though I'm not a big breakout player, I do occasionally look at breakouts in IPOs as a, as a possible trade. But now it's kind of it's come all the way back to its to its breakout. So once a stock fails on that grandiose manner, uh, I'm no longer excited about it. But yeah, it did rally up, you know, in spite of that. Does it? it market do whatever it wants, right? Doesn't matter what I think, and so far came back in. I hate when you ask for black coffee and they ask if you want milk. <laughs> Uh, I can't copy links from this. I wonder why I won't. Let's see. Copy. No, I can't. Uh, oh, hang on. Let's see if I can do this. No, it won't let me copy. Unfortunately, uh, Andre, it won't let me copy links. If you could email me these things ahead of time, I'll be happy to bring them up. Andre wants to talk about Bitcoin, um, which is kind of interesting. MBLY. We should make an ETF on the Bitcoin, huh? This is kind of interesting. It's kind of a double top knockout type of move. Um, it looks okay. Uh, why am I? What's what am I? It looks okay. Uh, a little too many days in 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 between here, but you know what? You could certainly do a lot worse. Um, I'm gonna give that an okay. And uh, not bad. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is a stock. You'll probably see this on my list tonight. You know, I always say that, and then I kind of pick them apart a little bit, but. Uh, that's not bad. I'm going to give you an okay on that one, Phil. All right. Looks like we've got some Livermore quotes. Perfect. First, do not be invested in the market all the time. There are many times when I have been completely in cash, especially when I was unsure of the direction of the market and waiting for confirmation of the next move. Yeah, absolutely. And Jesse Livermore went on to say um, along those lines, like don't feel like you have to be there in and out, in and out all day, every day let other people do that for you and they're actually building the groundwork for your next venture and if you think about what he's actually saying he's actually saying about building that base so if that big base gets built i'm using hand gestures but that big base gets built like we have in the s p 500 okay and we begin to break out of that base then this is going to be a nice support level when the market begins to take off Conversely, and unfortunately, if we get to break down from that base, this is going to be a mountain of overhead supply, and that market's going to have a very hard time getting back through that. Now, we're not afraid to short. I don't like shorting. It's not my favorite thing in the world to do. Uh, retrace rallies suck, to put it mildly, okay? But sometimes that's the only thing there is to do in the markets, and sometimes you have to take what's given to you, okay? NWO. Uh, it's not coming up. NWO, you sure you got the right si signal? Signal. S symbol? TXMD? Right, that one I know. Um, yeah, we talked about this one a while back. Um, I kind of like to see them take out their old highs decisively. From a, you, know, you always need to back your chart way out. But on a micro level, let's pick it apart a little bit. Uh, you know, I hear you. It's got the double top knockout look to it, but there's too many days in between. Uh, what was the one we were just looking at? Uh, not the P's before that. That one. You don't have as many days in between, whereas, I don't know if I'm going to let me go back to it. Now, in this particular case, you have too many days in between your knockout moves, okay? And if anything, it looks like it's rolling over. So, with, with a doubt, throw your, um, and this is a wonderful teaching example. I'm so glad you brought it up. When in doubt, okay, let's say we look at this, hey, it looks pretty good. It looks like it's headed higher. It's kind of knockout, kind of pulling back. But I do notice that it has gone a little sideways in here. Let me just throw my moving averages in. Uh-oh, what do we have? You got a bow tie down. So that's not a good thing. So on a bounce, this could actually be a short, okay? And then you also have overhead supply. Now, keep in mind, it's nothing magical about any indicator. All indicators, at least all price, well, Let's just talk about price indicators. Let's not be stupid and use something that, that has no merit whatsoever. So all price indicators have lag because they're derivative of price. And some people do an indicator of indicator. Guilty as charged. I used to do that early on. I did, uh, um, I don't want to pick on the gentleman, but there is a gentleman out there that used derivatives of derivatives in his indicators. And I was doing the same thing and making my own indicators of derivatives of derivatives. 
and it gets really messy really fast and you create a whole lot of lag when you're doing that okay but keep in mind that every indicator has lag because it's price based now with that said indicators can illustrate as i often preach it can illustrate something that's already in the chart maybe it's something you didn't see so when i first look at this chart first thing i see not on that one is like oh this is a stock in a longer term uptrend that's pulled back it looks pretty good and then i start picking it apart as i just did but one thing that I wouldn't have seen until I realized that, well, wait a minute, we're going about a month or so or two months sideways. When I throw that moving average in, it's like, aha, I've got a moving average crossover to bow tie. So this is a possible top in the works. OK, so right before you decide to pull the trigger on something just for S and G's, if, unless it's something obvious that looks like looks like this. It looks like that, then that's a no brainer. But if it's something that's going sideways a little bit, throw those moving averages in there. And then all of a sudden, you'll get a little bit better perspective. You'll see this base a little bit better, and you'll see the breakdown from the base. And again, this is a, remember that pattern we just talked about? Look at this. This is a base breakout followed by implosion on the other side of the base. Okay, so this stock looks like it's in trouble. I don't know if you look at the short that or not, uh, Andre, but I hope it didn't beat you up too much if you were. NWBO, 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 okay. Uh, this is one that caught my eye a few days back, but the knockout was all the way to this prior little base in here. And if you kind of, even if you take this big bar out, it broke out and now it's come all the way back to the base. And then, you know, you can see that dead. It's gone mostly sideways since two months. So you've got two months on a net net basis without much progress. I would pass on that one. Okay. We've got a few minutes left. You guys want to talk about a few more guys and girls, I should say. I guess while we're in impasse, let me uh, thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, anything unanswered or any stock picks unanswered, whatever, you feel free to shoot me an email. Um, if it's an answer that requires thought, I can always use it as fodder for next week's show. Okay, let me give a, a minute or two. Okay, you're welcome, Carol. Anybody else going once? Oh, DDD. That's a body printing. Part company. My daughter worked for one for a company that's printing uh, body parts. This is just a 3D printer. Um, yeah, as a possible short. I mean, look at that. That's amazing, huh? And this is why this is why money management is crucial, right? But it just looks like it's a little sold out. With a short, I'd rather go after shorts as they're beginning to roll over, as opposed to in long, long, long-term downtrends. Um, also, it's a little bit scary to go after these more volatile stocks as shorts. Um, but yeah, certainly in a downtrend, but I think I would pass on that. But you know, as a pure trend follower, I can't argue with the fact that this is a knockout move. Okay. It just looks like it's, it's, it's kind of done. It went from 90 all the way down to 14. You know, I'd much rather trade this on some transitional patterns early in the, in the, uh, deal. You're welcome, Leon. See you next week. Cool. Okay, uh, I think that's I think we're out of time. Everyone, thanks again. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm humbled by your appearance here. So thank you so much. I'll uh, see you guys. Um, I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. <laughs>